Hi class, welcome to the next lecture of the Medical Parasitology Lab. Today we're going to be covering Ameria related organisms. So just to begin with Ameria itself, Ameria is a genus of protozoan parasites that belongs to the phylum Epicomplexa, class Quinoidacidia. And Ameria is responsible for the intestinal disease coccidiosis in a variety of animals. Ameria is a monozenous or homozenous organism. That means that the life cycle can be completed within a single host. So it has a large economic impact on the poultry industry, also the cattle industry. Um, it's also a common disease in kittens and puppies. So other organisms that we're going to be talking about today in this class also includes Cryptosporidium and Toxoplasma. Um, all of the diseases that we're going to be talking about today are zoonotic diseases, meaning they can be spread from animals to people or from people to animals. So starting with the Ameria life cycle, what happens in an animal host is unsporulated oocysts are shed in the feces. Oocysts are extremely environmentally resistant and they can survive for up to one year in dry, cool environments. Once they're released, the unsporulated oocysts undergo meiosis, upon contact with oxygen and moisture. Um, this is when sporulation occurs, and this is what is necessary for the oocyst to become infectious. So there will be four sporocysts within an oocyst, and then there are two sporozoites inside of each sporocyst. So then there's eight sporozoites inside of each oocyst. So then when you swallow the oocyst, the oocyst releases the four sporozoites, and then later the four sporocysts will release the two sporozoites each. So then two sporozoites then invade the gut cells. Once they invade the gut cells, they then transform into the trophozoite stage, which is um, they just attach to the intestinal cells and steal nutrients from the host. Um, they then feed and they feed in this form. Eventually they form a schizont which is where they perform their asexual reproduction, which is referred to as schizogeny. When they're inside of the schizont, they're referred to as merozoites. And so these merozoites are what are then released from the schizont. And eventually the merozoites then form male or female gametes or sexual organs. You can have the microgamete, which is the male, or the macrogamete, which is the female. When they're undergoing sexual reproduction, that's referred to as gametogony. So these male and female gametocytes will then merge and fertilize one another to form another oocyst. And then again, unsporulated oocysts are shed in the feces. And when they're immediately shed in the feces, they're non-infectious because it takes, again, two to seven days for them to become sporulated, which that's when they're then infectious. So um, coming back to the schizont form, something that can also happen is the merozoites will just continue um, to reinfect the same epithelial cells or intestinal cells and continue to just go through the asexual reproduction phase, just perpetuating the infection within the intestines. So here's showing the progression of Ameria existation or the release of sporozoites. So here we have sporulated oocysts. You can see the sporocysts inside of the oocyst. So here the black arrows show the wall of the sporulated oocyst breaking down. So these are actually undergoing existation. And then here in the red arrow is showing an unsporulated oocyst. So this one is not yet undergoing existation. And then in this third image, we see the sporozoites have been released. They're labeled with the asterisk. So moving on to a more detailed image of the Emeria sporozoite. Um, so labeled in R, they have something known as refractile bodies. These are just protein inclusions inside the cytoplasm. Um, their exact function isn't known, but they're hypothesized to contain proteins necessary for cell invasion and for metabolic function. So they overall just help the sporozoite survive. You can see the nucleus here in the center, and then these small black arrows are pointing to the mitochondria. So the sporozoites are modal organisms, and they are the one that invade the enterocytes of the small intestine. And it's believed that these refractile bodies may also help them invade and release secretions that may help them invade the small intestinal cells. So here's showing the merozoites within a schizont, where the asexual reproduction occurs. And again, the merozoites will eventually 
develop into either male or female gametes. Male known as microgamete, female known as macrogamete. And they will eventually form the oocyst after this occurs. So this right here is the asexual reproduction form that occurs within the intestines of the host. So here's a more detailed image of the merozoite. The apical complex organelles present here at the anterior end. It's present in both sporozoites and merozoites. So these organelles include the microamines, the rotrophies, the polar rings, and the conoid. Um, all of these organisms just overall function in secreting proteins and other products that can help invade the host cells. You can see their nucleus just here in the center. They have a nucleolus. So overall, just know that their apical complex is important for helping them invade the host cells. So the apical complex organelles is also, together, is known as an organelle known as an epicoplast, which is something that epicomplexins have. So it's, an, it's also known as a plastid. This is just an organelle that helps in their metabolism and aids in their invasion of the host. And it was believed to have been formed through endosymbiosis. Um, we'll talk more about that right now. So moving on to our next parasite, Toxoplasma gondii. So it is responsible for the disease Toxoplasmosis. Um, it's one of the most common human infections throughout the world. It's known as being dangerous for pregnant women because it can be spread to the developing fetus. So cats are the definitive host of this disease. The definitive host meaning that they support the adult or the sexually reproductive form of the parasite. The parasite is heterozygous, meaning that its life cycle needs more than one host in order to be fully completed. And covering more about what I mentioned earlier about the epicoplast organelles. So they just function various metabolic pathways of epicomplexins and they're necessary to help um, metabolism and, in, and in invasion. So it's believed that this organelle was formed through a eukaryotic organism swallowing algae through endosymbiosis and that's how they formed that organelle. So moving on to the life cycle of Toxoplasma gondii. So it begins when the cat sheds fecal oocysts, which they're similarly to Maria, they're not sporulated immediately. It takes them a few days to become sporulated, so they're not immediately infectious. So then another small mammal, such as a mouse or a bird, can then ingest the actual feces itself or food contaminated with the cat's feces that contains sporulated oocysts. And then the parasite will then form tissue cysts within the muscles of these small mammals. And then the cat will then eat these small mammals and then ingest the infected meat. And that's how the cat continues to be infected. So humans can become infected when they ingest the sporulated oocyst through either eating undercooked meat or through a dirty cat litter box that hasn't been changed in quite a few days or also through contaminated food or water that contains the sporulated oocysts. And now something else that can happen is um, a person can transmit the disease to another person through either a blood transfusion or um, a pregnant mother can also transmit the parasite to the developing fetus and then the parasite can then form tissue cysts within the muscles of the human or eventually they can actually spread to the brain of the human and start causing um, neurological disorders. So here's a more detailed look at what goes on inside of the bodies of the definitive hosts and the intermediate hosts. So what happens is the cat will ingest the cysts, the tissue cysts, um, the cysts then rupture to release trophozoites. Um, the trophozoites then invade the intestinal cells. And then inside of those intestinal cells, they form schizons. And then they undergo schizogony, which is the asexual form of reproduction. So um, eventually, over time, these trophozoites will then start to form the sexual form of reproduction, the micro and macro gametes and they will undergo gamogony, which is sexual reproduction, to produce the oocyst. The oocyst will then be released through the feces of the cat, and then there will be f two sporoblasts inside of one oocyst, and then each sporoblast contains four sporozoites, you can see here in this image. So it takes about seven to ten days within the environment for the oocyst to become sporulated and infectious.
So then an intermediate host, such as a small mammal, a mouse, or a bird, will then ingest the sporulated oocysts, and the sporozoites will then be released into the intestinal cells of this intermediate host, and then eventually they'll become tachyzoites once they're inside of the intestinal cells. That's what they're called. They're called tachyzoites. So normally, in a healthy individual, they'll just continue to reproduce within the intestinal cells as tachyzoites. But then what can happen in an unhealthy individual, such as someone who is immunocompromised, is they can um, begin to invade monocytes, such as immune cells, and they will then replicate inside these monocells, known as endodiogeny. And so once they enter these immune cells, they then spread through the blood, and then they can then reach the brain, the heart, the lungs, the muscles, the placenta in a pregnant woman, and that's how they get spread to the fetus. And so once they reach these sites that are away from the intestines, they then form the cysts, and the form inside of the cyst is referred to as bredizolites, and then this cycle will then just repeat itself when another mammal eats undercooked meat, and they and then ingest these tissue cysts. The bredizolites then transform into tachyzoites again once they reach the intestinal cells, and then if a intermediate host gets eaten by a cat, then the cysts will rupture, and then they will transform into trophozoites instead of tachyzoites, and that's when the cycle repeats itself inside of the cat. So here's an image of a T. gondii oocyst. This is a sporulated oocyst. You can tell it's sporulated because you can actually see the two sporocysts or sporoblasts inside of the oocyst, and then inside of the sporocyst you have four sporozoites inside each and again, this results from sexual reproduction occurring within the definitive host, or the cat. So only the definitive host is going to release oocysts. And here's a more detailed image of the tachyzoite. So here you can see close to the center is the apicoplast, which is just necessary for metabolism and possibly helping in invading the epithelial cells. More of these apical complex organelles up here that also help invade the host cell. So here is just showing um, an infected host cell containing a bunch of tachyzoites. They're in the lighter purple color. These um, black dots are known as dense granules, and those dense granules also secrete proteins that can help invade an invasion. So this area where the tachyzoites are inside of is referred to as the parasitophorous vacuole, and that's where they undergo the replication, and eventually they will burst or lyse the host cell when they become too numerous. Um, so here's just an idea of how small the tachyzoites are compared to an epithelial cell, a bronchial epithelial cell, so here at the end are the cilia, and so here are the two tachyzoites. So it just gives you an idea of their size. And so just something that I think is interesting to go over is the T. gondii rosette conformation. So whenever the tachyzoites reproduce asexually via the endodiogeny, two daughter cells will be assembled within a mother cell. So here in the yellow arrows, the very two small white dots, those are two daughter cells being formed from a mother cell. And so once the daughter cells emerge, the mother cell will actually be destroyed. And so what happens is the new daughter cells will then form this circular structure known as the rosette conformation around the mother cell which the dead mother cell is referred to as the residual body. The exact reason why they do this isn't really known, but it is thought that they can take some nutrients from the remnant body or the dead mother cell. So that's overall just something interesting that they do and something that is unique to T. gondii. And this is something that you'll only see within the intermediate host. And so eventually this rosette conformation will get so large that that's when the epithelial cell of the host will then be burst because there's just so many parasites within this cell. And then when this cell becomes burst, that's known as the lytic cycle. So here's the T. gondii cyst, which contains bradyzolites. So the tissue cysts are most common to see within the host's, the intermediate host's brain, skeletal muscle, or cardiac muscle. And they can actually remain inside of the host throughout the entire host's lifetime. And the cysts are present during the latent infection, meaning that it's possible for them to go undiagnosed during this time, as they don't really show severe symptoms until really they've reached your brain and you're undergoing 
severe like neurologic problems. Under light microscopy, it's very hard to differentiate bradyzoites from tachyzoites. So the most important thing to know about bradyzoites is you'll just see them inside of the cyst, where you won't see the tachyzoites inside of the cyst. So here is overall a visual summary of the T. gondii tachyzoites and the bradyzoites. So tachyzoites are present in the acute infection. This is when they're actively bursting and lysing epithelial cells, where in the chronic infection, um, they're just hanging out and kind of dormant within muscles, the brain, or the heart. And they're just um, inside of the cyst, really just surviving and growing very slowly, where the tachyzoites will be within that vacuole and they'll be very fast replicating and will quickly do damage because they will quickly lyse and damage epithelial cells. So they're very destructive for the host tissue. Drug treatment can be used to eliminate the tachyzolite form. Um, however, drug treatment cannot be used against the bradyzolite form because they're inside of that cyst wall that protects them. And something that can cause tachyzolites to become bradyzolites is stress. If they undergo stress, they can form the cysts to protect themselves from any damage. And then whenever stress stops, they can then transform back in the tachyzoites form to then replicate more rapidly. So moving on to the next parasite of today is cryptosporidium. So cryptosporidium is responsible for cryptosporidiosis. It manifests as a diarrheal disease in immunocompetent people, but in immunocompromised individuals it can be fatal. It is a monoxenous organism, so it only needs one host to complete its life cycle. And something that sets cryptosporidium apart from the other organisms that we're talking about today is the oocyst form is already sporulated when it exits the host, so that means immediate infection can occur or direct fecal oral transmission can occur. And then something that's also interesting about cryptosporidium or something that sets it apart from the other organisms we talked about today is that it lacks an epicoplast. So here's the life cycle of cryptosporidium. So overall, it's um, pretty similar to the other organisms that we've talked about. So the way a human gets infected is through ingesting the oocyst, which is already sporulated. Um, it then reaches the intestines, and so when they're in the small intestine, you have a meront, which is where they undergo their asexual reproduction. And the meront then releases the merozoite. The merozoite then form type 2 merons, and that's when they begin the sexual reproduction cycle. The merozoites are released from this type 2 meron, and then from there, they then begin to differentiate into the microgamont, which is the male form, or the macrogamont, which is the female form. The male then releases microgametes, which then fertilizes the macrogamont, and that produces a zygote. And then so what can happen is you can either form a thick-walled oocyst or a thin-walled oocyst, so the thick wall of the oocyst will be sporulated, and that's what will exit the host through the feces. The thin wall oocyst can actually just reinfect the host because the wall is so thin that it will then just break inside of the host, and then sporozoites will then be released, and the sporozoites will then invade the intestinal cells, and then once they're inside the intestinal cells, they will become trophozoites, and then as trophozoites, they will then take nutrients from the intestinal cells. So really what really differentiates the reproduction of cryptosporidium from Toxoplasma gondii is that instead of reproducing inside of a schizont, they reproduce in what's called a meront instead. So here's an image showing cryptosporidium oocysts. So here are the sporulated oocysts, stained in purple. And so something that can occur in cryptosporidium is when you use this acid fast stain, you can get some that for some reason they just don't take up the stain and they're referred to as ghosts since they just don't take up the stain for whatever reason. It's not really known why. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Oocysts can contain up to four sporozoites inside of them and the sporozoites are what are stained in purple. So here's a more detailed image of the sporozoite. So you have the host apical membrane of the intestinal cell. So what happens is cryptosporidium actually utilizes the cell membrane of the host epithelial cell itself in order to later 
create its parasitophosphorus vacuole, which it uses to protect itself from lysosomes. And then here the anterior vacuole is what will later become the feeder organelle, which it uses to take nutrients from the host epithelial cell. And so here is the cryptosporidium trophozoite. So here in this large image is the entire cytoplasm of cryptosporidium. Um, here surrounding the trophozoite is the parasitophorus vacuole, and that's what it uses for protection. So the trophozoite actually does not penetrate or enter the epithelial cell itself. Instead, it just sits on top of it, and this vacuole acts for protection. And the feeder organelle here has contact with the epithelial cell, and that's what it used to uptake nutrients from the host. And then just here you can see the microvilli of the intestinal cell. So here's images showing the different cryptosporidium stages. And here we have the trophozoite attached to the epithelial cell. We have the marant containing the merozoites, so that's the asexual form of reproduction. We have the type 2 marant, which will then later differentiate into the female or male gametocytes. So here we have the macrogametocyte, which is the female, the microgametocyte, which is the male, and here we have the non-sporulated oocyst, which will likely just release more sporozoites, resulting in auto-infection of the host. Alright, so moving on to the last parasite of today is cyclospora. All cyclospora cases have only been found in humans. There is no known animal reservoir, so it's only known to infect humans. And the life cycle and the reproduction is very similar to cryptosporidium. However, what differentiates cyclosporus from cryptosporidium is that when the oocyst is freshly passed in stool, cyclospora oocysts are not infective, so they're not sporulated, so they're not immediately infective. It does take a few days for them to become sporulated and infectious. So here is the cyclospora life cycle. So you have to ingest the sporulated oocyst um, through contaminated food or water that can sets contaminated with fecal matter containing the oocysts. Once they reach the small intestine, they then exist and they release the sporocyst. The sporocyst then releases sporozoites. The sporozoites then invade the intestinal cells. And they then begin their asexual reproduction as a type 1 merant. They release merozoites. Merozoites then can further differentiate into the type 2 merant. And then this type 2 merant produces the merozoites that will then go on to create the sexual form of reproduction, the microgametocyte and the macrogametocyte. The microgametocyte fertilizes the macrogametocyte and that produces a zygote. And then from the zygote, the oocyst is then made. It is unsporulated when it exits the host. So here's an image of the cyclospora oocyst. So something that is unique to the cyclospora oocyst is they actually autofluoresce or they glow and under an ultraviolet microscope. This is something that does not occur in cryptosporidium. So here's a diagram um, comparing the cryptosporidium to the cyclospora oocysts. So when doing an acid fast stain, both of them can show these ghosts that for some reason just don't take up the stain. And then when you do an acid fast stain, they stain a different color, the ones that do stain. Cryptosporidium will be more so red, where cyclospora will be more so purple. And like I mentioned earlier, the Cryptosporidium oocysts are infective immediately when they exit the host, where cyclospora has to be sporulated first, so it takes them a few days to become infective. And cryptosporidium is smaller, about 4 to 6 microns, where cyclospora is about 8 to 10 microns. And then in this cyclospora image, you'll kind of notice that the entire oocyst is purple. It's not really like in sections, kind of like how you see here. And that's just because it's not sporulated yet, so you're not going to see the individual sporozoites. And so they will be visible once it is sporulated. Alright, so that's the end of today's lecture. I hope you learned something, and I hope you have a good day. See you next lecture.